Welcome back. It's time for another lesson. This time we're talking about field symmetries. So let's, let's get started. First of all, I want to point out that the magnetic fields and the electric fields we've been talking about, at least up until this point, have had very different symmetries. Electric fields have been produced by charges, and they have been kind of pointy. Uh, in other words, they uh, all the electric field lines all point away from the charge or point toward the charge. There are no closed loops in these fields. They simply go out and um, in this case, if you have a bunch of charge in a box, for example, and no other charge anywhere in the universe, they just go out to infinity. On the other hand, the magnetic fields have circulated around currents. So you have currents flowing somewhere and the magnetic field lines loop around. They're kind of loopy in comparison. And so there are mathematical ways of, how can I say, uh, quantifying the degree of pointiness, or uh, maybe you could say flexiness of a field, and the loopiness. So the way you calculate or estimate or quantify the pointiness of a field is by computing something called the flux. The flux is the integral of the electric field dotted into uh, area vectors which point from the inside of a surface to the outside of a surface. They have a magnitude that's proportional to the area and a direction that's perpendicular to the surface going pointing from the inside to the outside. The way you quantify the loopiness is to integrate a line integral around a loop. And the line integral is a vector integral where you dot the vector field into the local direction of the line, a vector that's proportional to the length of the chunk of line that you're moving along, and it points in the direction of the path that you're taking around the loop. So we'll talk a little bit more about these integrals and how you actually do them. But just to sort of feed our intuition a little bit about these guys, we're going to do a little demo. So here we are. We have a blue rod, a cylindrical distribution of charge. And we're going to imagine a Gaussian surface surrounding that charge. Let's go ahead and back up a little bit so you can see it. The notion is that we want to pick a surface so that the electric field pierces it everywhere, either parallel or perpendicular to the surface. You can imagine the electric field from this charge distribution is going to point away from the cylinder everywhere. And so a solid cylinder, as the one shown here, satisfies the, the necessary properties. It, uh, its surfaces are parallel to the field at the ends and perpendicular to the field on the sides. And so the e dot da dot product is going to give us non-zero values. In fact, the cosine will be 1 on these outer surfaces, and the cosine will be 0 at the end caps. And so the integral becomes uh, a simple multiply, because the magnitude of the electric field only depends on distance from the axis, and these guys are all the same distance from the axis, since the Gaussian surface is concentric. And uh, the dot product is 1 everywhere, so the magnitude of the dot product uh, I should say the e cosine theta part is constant, comes out of the integral, and then all you end up with is the integral of dA, the integral of the areas, which is just the area of the sides. So we'll see how that goes, and, uh, and that's how it works. Here we have a similar idea, except now we have a distribution of current. So the idea is the current is flowing up this uh, cylindrical, it's really a wire, I guess, in this case, and the magnetic field lines are now going to circulate around the wire. So I've tried to indicate the magnetic field lines with an arrow field here. Notice that the arrows get smaller as you move away from the wire, which makes sense because the magnetic field is going to drop like 1 over r. They get larger as you get close to the wire, and of course they run into each other here, which is a problem with my scaling. But uh, there's really nothing to do about it. Uh, the problem is no matter what scaling I pick, I'll run into trouble, it seems like, sooner or later. But uh, the question is then, what does my uh, loop look like that I'm going to use to integrate b dot dl? So the idea is you pick a loop that's going to go around the wire so that everywhere the loop, the, these are the dl vectors here, these little red guys, 
they are going to be parallel to the, the local magnetic field along the wire. So B dot DL is simply going to be the magnitude of the magnetic field at that R, which is going to be a constant as you go around since the magnitude only depends on R, um, dotted into DL, and the dot product will always give you 1, and the B magnitude is always the same. So the B and the cosine come out of the integral, and you just get the integral of DL, which is of course nothing other than the circumference of the circle. So this terrible looking integral turns out to be nothing other than the magnetic field times the length of the path, which is simply the circumference of that circle. So that makes it pretty darn easy. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about pointy fields and curly fields, I guess. The book calls them curly, but uh, I would say that uh, pointy fields have a characteristic, a mathematical characteristic, which is that they have a flux through a closed surface, and maybe we could give that a name, since we're inventing names anyway, what the heck. We'll call that fluxish. And um, an integral that goes around a loop measures a characteristic, maybe we could call it loopish. So we measure the loopishness, which tells you if the field is curly. You measure the fluxus, fluxishness, <laughs> it tells you whether the field is pointy. So uh, let's see how that actually works. So the, uh, the idea is that the integral of the flux through a closed surface is determined by the amount of flux piercing that surface from the inside to the outside. And we count the flux that pierces from the inside to the outside as positive. And if it goes the other way around, if it goes from the outside to the inside, that counts as negative. Turns out that's equal to the total charge enclosed in the surface divided by epsilon zero. And uh, that ought to kind of make sense because if there's charge enclosed, it's going to produce electric field lines that point out, and when they pierce the surface, they'll contribute positively. And if there's only positive charge enclosed, they will all point out, and therefore we'll get a positive flux. On the other hand, if there's negative charge enclosed, it'll all contribute negatively since the flux will point from the outside to the inside. The dot products will all be negative numbers, e dot dA, and, uh, and we'll get a negative result. So that, that ought to have at least a little intuitive appeal. We'll see in, in a couple of examples in class and also uh, in homework how that really works, but, uh, but that's the idea. Now what about the flux from a magnetic field? Well, a magnetic field produces flux in loops. I mean, it, it produces a field that sort of loops around. And so if you, if you make a closed surface, the loop is going to pierce the surface going from inside to out at one place, but then when you come around, it's going to pierce the surface out to in in another. And it turns out the net result is that there's no flux, no net flux of magnetic field through a closed surface. And this is, uh, this is really always true. It, it is a consequence of the fact that there's no such thing as magnetic charge. The magnetic field always comes from moving charges from currents, and so since there's no magnetic charge, the net flux has to be zero. Now, up until this point, the electric fields we've been dealing with have all been produced by charges, and they've all been fluxish, and uh, are pointy. And so what that means is if you integrate E dot DL around any closed loop, you always end up with a zero. And, uh, but that's about to change. When we get to the next chapter, we're going to find that's going to change. So I'm going to put here that this integral is zero for now. Uh, if you like, if you define the electric field here to be the Coulomb electric field, the electric field produced by charges, then it will always be zero. But it turns out there's another way to make an electric field we'll learn about in the next chapter uh, that makes that's not Coulomb based. It doesn't depend on charges. It depends on something else. And uh, in that case, this, this integral will not be zero. And finally, the integral of B dot DL around a loop depends on the amount of current enclosed in the. So if I make a loop in space that goes around and I integrate B dot DL around the loop, we know that the magnetic fields are produced by currents. And it turns out that if you enclose current in the loop, then this integral b dot dl ends up being non-zero. And in fact, it's proportional to the current enclosed in the loop. So um, you can see that the first integral, the integral of the flux of the electric field being equal to the charge enclosed in the surface that defines the surface over which the integral is done, 
and the line integral of b dot dl around a loop being equal to the current that passes through the loop around which the integral is done are very similar to one another. So let's do a couple of examples to see how this works out. Imagine we have a two concentric conductors, a solid conductor in the center that's cylindrical, and a, a shell, a cylindrical shell conductor at the outside. And let's sprinkle some positive charge on the outer surface of the inner conductor and around the inner surface of the outer conductor. This is going to produce an electric field that points from the central conductor out to the outer conductor. And let's imagine a surface that encloses the inner conductor through which we can compute some flux. So we'll integrate the flux of the electric field through this sort of orangey surface and then we'll demand that that be equal to the charge enclosed divided by epsilon zero. Well the length of the cylindrical surface is h um, its cross-sectional area, I'm sorry, its circumference is 2 pi r. So there's, there's actually two sorts of surfaces here. There's the end caps of the cylinder, but of course the electric field is parallel to those surfaces because it points from the inner conductor toward the outer conductor. And by the way, we're, we're not really looking at the end of the conductor, we're looking at just a cross-section. So I imagine that it goes on in both directions, into the page and out of the page. So the electric field is everywhere uh, perpendicular to the end cap surfaces. I'm sorry, it's parallel to the end cap surfaces, perpendicular to the end cap area vector. So the area vector for the end cap points along the axis of the cylinder, and the electric field points away from the axis toward the outer surface. And so the area vector for the end cap and the electric field are perpendicular. And that goes for both end caps. So there's no flux piercing the end caps of this uh, Gaussian surface, this orangey imaginary cylinder that we're inventing in our minds. But there is electric field piercing the side of the can, oh, going from the inner conductor to the outer conductor. And so we need the area of the side of the can times the electric field. Notice that the electric field is constant in magnitude over that surface. So it can come out of the integral since it's just a constant. The dot product is always 1. In other words, the angle between the electric field and the area vectors on the surface, on the side surface of the can, are, are always 0. The angle is always 0. So the cosine is always 1. And so what you end up with is simply the magnitude of the electric field times the area of the sides of the can. That's simply the circumference, 2 pi r, times the length of the can, h. <coughs> so. The flux is the electric field magnitude times 2 pi r h, and that's got to equal the charge enclosed. Well, the charge enclosed is simply the proportion of the charge in the little can, uh, the fraction of the charge in the little can that fits inside compared to the total charge on the whole thing. So if the whole thing has a charge, capital Q, the can is a length h, the entire wire, or the uh, structure has a length capital L, then H divided by capital L is the fraction of the length that's included in the little orange can. And if I multiply the fraction of the length by the total charge, I'll get the fraction of the charge in the little orange can. In other words, the charge in the can divided by the length of the can is equal to the charge in the conductor divided by the length in the conductor. And if I solve that for the charge in the can, I get h over big L times capital Q. And I want to divide that by epsilon zero to write out the relationship. This is called Gauss's law, by the way. And I can use that to then solve for the electric field. So it's cool. I simply write down the statement that the flux is equal to the charge enclosed. I work out a little geometry and boom, I've got the electric field. Now, in a sense, this is, uh, this is much easier than solving the Coulomb integral for the electric field inside this space. Um, we do have to do an integral, but because we know something about the symmetry of the field, the integral is actually pretty trivial because the electric field is constant and it just ends up being electric field times area. Now it's only true if this, this uh, long cylinder is actually quite long and we're far away from the ends where goofy stuff happens. But if that's true, if it, we are, if it is very long and we are far away, then 
it works out pretty easily and pretty well. Let's, uh, let's do another example and see how it goes. Let's say, for example, we have current flowing in the uh, outer uh, conductor, and we have current flowing into the inner conductor. And so we have, uh, we're basically, say we're delivering current at the end of a long coaxial cable <clears throat> to, to some thing at the end of the long coaxial cable. And we're interested in the magnetic field in the cable. So uh, it's a different situation. We're integrating the integral of B dot DL. So we pick a loop between the inner conductor and the outer conductor. We set that equal to the current enclosed and divide and multiply by mu zero. This is, this is Ampere's law. Well, the magnetic field, you know, is going to circulate around inside, and it's constant if you're at a radius concentric with the center conductor. The symmetry of the thing is such that the magnetic field can only depend on your distance from the center. So that means it has to be 2 pi r times the magnetic field. That's going to be equal to mu zero times the current enclosed, and boom, we get the magnetic field inside this complicated conducting geometry. It turns out that it's the same formula as the magnetic field from a long straight wire of zero radius. So as long as you're between the inner conductor and the outer conductor, the magnetic field is the same as you'd get if you just had a long straight wire carrying current I. Furthermore, um, the outer conductor doesn't make any difference at all to the magnetic field. It's similar to the situation when we had a spherically symmetric charge distributions and the electric field depended only on the charge inside the, the uh, point, the, the sphere that surrounds the point that you are at. Uh, interesting. So that's the answer when uh, R is between R1 and R2. Now what about the case when R is less than R1? Well then we need to compute the current density and uh, that's going to be the total current divided by the cross-sectional area of the inner guy and then the current enclosed becomes the density times the area of the loop and we make a little loop inside that inner guy and uh, we get that the current enclosed is now R divided by R1 squared and but it's the same answer we just means we take the current enclosed divided by 2 pi r. <clears throat> so that's not too bad. And we get an answer where the magnetic field actually goes up from zero at the center to uh, what you would expect at the surface of the inner conductor. Now if we add in the uh, result we had before, now we have two results. We have a result from zero to r1 and from r1 to r2. What about from R2 to R3? Well, at this point, we need to compute the current density in the outer conductor. That's minus I divided by the surface, cross-sectional surface area of the, uh, of the outer conductor. And then I can compute the total current enclosed as the current through the inner conductor, which is just I, plus the current through the part of the outer conductor that the loop intercepts. So we get this much more complicated looking beast and we get the result that when R is less than R3 I'm sorry, when R is between R2 and R3 we get this complicated looking thing. What about when R is greater than R3? Well that's easy because the total current enclosed is zero and that means the magnetic field has to be zero. So we get uh, really four results. We get 0 to R1, R1 to R2, R2 to R3, and greater than R3. Um, if you take all that and put it together, you'll see that you get a magnetic field that goes from 0 up to a maximum when you reach the outer surface of the inner conductor. It goes like 1 over R as you're going between the inner conductor and the outer conductor, and then it drops in a complicated way, but it almost looks linear in the graph here when you go from R2 to R3. So, there you have it. Um, that's a nice example of Ampere's law applied to the current in a coaxial cable. And uh, if you have questions about this one, I know I went through that last one a little bit quickly, but uh, hopefully you got the idea. If not, please come and see me and we'll work it out. We'll talk to you soon.